We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. All right, so we're starting a brand new series going through the book of Colossians together. Over the next 12 weeks, we're going to be in the book of Colossians. So grab a copy of God's Word, open it up to Colossians. Next week, you'll know where to open as well for the next 12 weeks. We're going to go through this book. Uh, let me tell you, I'm not going to cover a ton of Colossians today. I'm actually only going to cover the first two verses, which doesn't seem like much. Like, how is someone going to talk for 40 minutes about the first two verses of Colossians? Well, let me tell you what we're going to do today. We're going to really intro the book and make sure you understand the context of the book. Let me tell you why context is important. Let me share with you, to make this point, my favorite Bible verse, okay? My favorite Bible verse is Ecclesiastes 10, 19. I'm not going to put it on the screen. You just have to listen. Here's what it says. A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry. And money is the answer for everything. Now, that's clearly not my favorite Bible verse. What that Bible verse is, is it's a wonderful example of why you always want to study God's Word in context, right? If you just uh, uh, decided, I'm going to take uh, Ecclesiastes 10:19 and tattoo that bad boy on my arm, you know, money is the answer for everything, it says right in the Bible, uh, that would be reading a Bible verse out of context, right? Not understanding why it's there and what surrounds it. So what we're going to do today is understand the who, the what, the when, and the why of Colossians so that the next 11 weeks we'll be able to read it in that context. Does that make sense? I'm excited about doing that with you. Uh, let me read the first two verses, and we'll, we'll, kick, we'll get right into it. All right, here's the first two verses of the book of Colossians. It says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God, our Father, give you grace and peace. That's where we're going to stop today. We're just going to cover some details in here and explore who's, who's Paul? Who's, who's this church in Colossae? Like, what's this deal? Like, and a couple things we see right off the bat before we get into the real meat of it. One thing that it's important to know is we call it the book of Colossians, but it's actually a letter. The book of Colossians is a letter written from one person to a group of people, and it, we see that it's, it's technically written by a guy named Paul. There's a shout out to Timothy, like Timothy backs up everything I'm saying, but technically what you're reading here is a letter written from a guy named Paul to a, a group of believers, so a church that already exists in a city called Colossae. That's the, the general gist of what we get from this verse. You know, what's interesting though, I want you to know this context before we get into it. Somewhere in chapter 4 of Colossians, it actually says Hey, church, as soon as you're done reading this letter, I want you to pass it along to another church so they can read it and apply it also. And have that church pass it along, right? And the letters I wrote to that church, I want you to read all the letters I wrote to them. So here's the beautiful thing. This letter was written to a church in Colossae many, many years ago, but it was meant to be passed along to us. It's a letter that was designed to be read in other churches and applied in other places. And so that's the, a little bit of the general context. A guy named Paul writing to a church of believers in Colossae, a letter that was meant to be passed along. And so here we are. We're going to study it together. What can we get out of it? Let's start with a basic question of who. Who is Paul? Now, many of you probably maybe grew up in the church or you've heard of Paul before, and maybe I'm not going to teach you anything new today, but it's important to understand the background of this guy named Paul so you can better appreciate the letter that he's writing to this church. This guy named Paul, when he was younger, he actually went by a different name, right? What was Paul's name before it was Paul? 
Saul. And so Saul, he was born in a city called Tarsus, and Tarsus was like a, a cultural hub. It was like an epicenter of uh, people who grew up in Tarsus. They were cultural elites. They were highly educated. They were really kind of the, the cream of the crop. These were like people that came out of Tarsus were going to come out really uh, knowing a lot and, and ready to be leaders wherever they're at, all right? And so we got this guy named Saul. He grew up in this, this uh, city called Tarsus. He's well-educated, really smart, sharp guy. And the first time we actually meet him in Scripture, the first time we hear about this guy is in the book of Acts. All right, so let's look at that. In Acts chapter 7, there's a situation going down where there's a guy named Stephen. And Stephen is a Christian, and Stephen is proclaiming the gospel. And the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, do not like this. And they're actually out on a mission to persecute and even kill Christians. And so Stephen, they've decided because he's a Christian, they're going to throw stones at him until he dies. They're going to basically throw them uh, until he's buried underneath them and then he's dead. And so this is at the stoning of Stephen. It says in verse 57 of chapter 7. It says, they rushed at him and dragged Stephen, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. It's the very first time in scripture you ever meet Saul, All right? So this is like our introduction to this guy who's written so much of the Bible, so much of the New Testament, and all these letters that we're going to... Uh, you know, refer to throughout this, this series. This is the guy right here. Now, I, I love what Luke says about Saul here in Acts, but let's see what Paul says about Paul. Before Paul went by Paul, right, he went by Saul, and this is what he had to say about himself. In Philippians 3, this is in Paul's own words, he says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And he says this, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. He says, I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. So this is how Paul describes himself when he was uh, you know, when he was persecuting Christians. You essentially meet this guy who was such a devout follower of, of Jewish law. He cons considers himself a Pharisee who, who very much was opposed to this new movement called Christianity. And so this young guy named Saul, we, we meet him in Acts chapter 7, and he's there when, when Christians are being killed for proclaiming the gospel. He's there, he's a He's, he's the, the one saying, hey, guys, go ahead and do it. You have my blessing. You can put your coats right here. I'll watch over them. Let's kill this guy. That's Saul, a hater of Christians, a persecutor of Christians. He also says about himself in Galatians 1.13, Paul says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. He says this, I did my best to destroy it. That was his mission in life, was to destroy the Christian church. This guy, who we're going to read his letter, he was a, a destroyer, a, someone who, who tried to destroy the Christian church. Then it says back in Luke's account of, of this guy named Saul in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Here's my point. If you were an early Christian, if you were a, one of the converts into Christianity in the early church in the book of Acts, you didn't want to come across Saul. Saul uttered threats with every word he could muster. He was constantly just trying to kill and persecute Christians. You didn't want to be around this guy. You wanted to try to avoid people like Saul because Saul hated Christianity and he hated Christians. This background of his is important to know because he's about to be radically changed. As you keep reading in Acts chapter 9, you get to the third verse, and you see that Saul has this incredible conversion. And here's a little bit about that story. In verse 3, 
It says, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's on this road, a little side note here, it says that he was on this road to Damascus, and he was on a mission. Can we just, a little side note here for just a moment? Every one of us in this room, whether or not you're pursuing godliness or you're pursuing worldliness, you are on a mission. Every single one of us has something that we're, we're devoting our time and our energy and our talents to. We are all pursuing a mission. And Saul was on a mission. He was on a mission to kill Christians. And while he's on this mission, it says that, that he, he encountered Jesus Christ. He got to see Jesus And Jesus came to him and said simply, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And that story goes on and you get to see this conversion where Saul, his life is radically changed and he becomes a follower of Jesus instead a persecutor of Jesus' followers. He decides he wants to be a person pursuing Christ and helping others pursue Christ. And his life is radically changed. There's a lot more to that story, but I want you to understand a couple things about how radically changed his life is. You know that 13 of the 27 New Testament books were written by Paul. Incredible. Pretty much half of your New Testament, as far as number of of books, uh, Paul had... His God had, you know, had him write these letters. You know, Paul took three missionary journeys. After becoming a follower of Christ, he basically became a missionary who went out. And, and by the way, you want to know on these three missionary journeys how far he traveled to share the good news of the gospel? Uh, you calculate all the different places he went on these three missionary journeys. He traveled about 10,000 miles. To give you an idea of how far that is, that's like traveling from New York City to Los Angeles and back, and then doing it again. New York City to Los Angeles and back. This is how far Paul, before you had all the the planes and the trains and the automobiles we have today, was traveling to share the good news of the gospel. His life was radically changed. He planted churches everywhere he landed. He, He planted churches, and so he was an incredible church planner. He went from a persecutor of Christians to being persecuted as a Christian. Radical transformation. Now what's interesting is a lot of us believe, because someone told us probably, that Jesus changed Saul's name. Because we don't call him Saul anymore, right? We all call him the Apostle Paul. And maybe someone told you at some point, that, yeah, you know, he was on the road to Damascus, and then Jesus came down and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And you need to follow me instead. And from now on, you're now going to be called Paul. But you know what? That actually never happens in Scripture. Jesus never changed Saul's name. And I want you to know this. Saul and Paul are actually the same name. Saul is the, the Hebrew form of the name, And Paul is the Greek form of the name. So if Jesus didn't change Paul's name, who did? Paul did. I can imagine there were conversations where his life has been radically transformed. He now has a a new identity. And and likely people came up to him and they're like, hey, Saul, can we talk for a second? And he probably was like, hey, you know, if you don't mind, I really like to go by Paul now. We see him change his name. In fact, the place that his name is changed, where we see it kind of flip in scripture, is in Acts chapter 13. By the way, Acts is basically the the gospel of Luke continued. It's written by Luke. Acts was written by Luke. And you get to kind of see where Luke ends, Acts picks up. So it's Luke part two. And it says in Acts 13 verse nine, it says, Luke says, uh, this is what Luke says about him, Saul, who is also called Paul. There it is. That's your transition. It doesn't say, God said from henceforth you shall now be known as Paul. 
No. We just know that there's a guy named Saul, and all of a sudden, after his life is radically changed, he starts going by Paul. Saul, who is also called Paul. And that leads us to our first takeaway. I want you to write these down in your notes, okay? Takeaway number one is that we need to choose to walk in our new identity. I want you to know that your life has been changed, right? We actually see in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you are a brother or sister in Christ, here's what it says about you. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, right? The old life is gone, a new life has begun. That's what scripture says about you. Your old life is gone, a new life has begun. The moment you gave your life to Christ. But you have to understand You have a new life as a Christian, but Scripture is super clear that you have the ability to choose to embrace that new life, to to embrace that new identity, or to choose to not. And I would ask many of you in this room, what choices are you making on a regular basis, and how does it reflect whether or not you're choosing to walk in your new identity, or whether or not you're still walking in your old one? It's a choice you get to make. Paul's the one who said, hey, listen, I used to identify really strongly with the Jewish and Hebrew people, so I decided to go by Saul, and now I really want to distance myself from that that way of thinking. So if you would do me a favor, I'm going to choose to walk in my new identity. Let's call me Paul now. How are people seeing you walk in your new identity as a Christian? You have to choose to walk in your new identity. It's similar to imagine if you were, uh, you know, uh, you have two people, they walk into an old dilapidated building, the guy who owns it, and he's trying to sell it to the other guy. So the guy's coming in, looking at the building, and the owner, building owner says, listen, I know this place is a wreck. Vandals have broken all the windows, and they've graffitied everything, and the floors are disgusting, and listen, I know this place is a wreck, but I, I listen, if you buy this building, I, I, I promise you I can, I can try to invest some money into helping you fix the things that are broken. I just really want you to buy it. The guy says, listen, you don't have to fix anything. I love the place. It's like, what do you mean, you love it? He's like, yeah, and you don't have to fix anything. What do you mean I don't have to fix anything? It's like, well, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to tear the whole thing down. I'm going to build something brand new on the lot. I want you to understand that when you give your life to Christ, it's not that, that Jesus is coming in and just patching up some holes in the wall. He's not just giving your insides a fresh coat of paint or putting down new carpet. It says the old life is demolished and you get a brand new life in Christ. A brand new identity. The problem is many of us choose to, to still walk in our old identity when we have the opportunity to choose to walk in our new one. Let me show you a passage of scripture that shows, I want you to look for verbs in here that show how we get to choose whether or not we do these things or not, all right? How the choice is yours. You'll see this in Romans 12, one and two. I'll put it up on the screen and you can look for these. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Do you notice in this verse, even just in the very first sentence, right? It says, I plead with you to give your bodies. You have the opportunity to live with open hands and say, God, in light of all that you've done for me, in light of the gospel, I'm going to open up my hands and freely give all of myself to you. But you also, if you have the freedom to give, it also means you have the freedom to hold on to. You have the freedom to say, God, I thank you for all that you've done, but I'm going to keep kind of a tight fist on all that I am because I don't really want you to mess with me all that much. You see, we have the opportunity to choose to live in our new identity. Just like we have the opportunity to choose to reject our new identities. 
And so one of the things I love about the story of Paul is it shows us that he embraced his new identity. He says, don't call me Saul no more. I'm going by Paul. I'm a new person. Let's look at takeaway number two. Takeaway number two is God has chosen a purpose for your life. God has chosen a purpose for your life. Let's explore this looking at verse one again. You're going to look for the word chosen. Are you ready? And Colossians 1.1 1, 1 says, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. Notice how Paul introduces himself. He says that he's Paul, but then he specifically tells you that the job that he has, the, the role that he's fulfilling, that he was chosen by God's will to do that thing. By the way, if you look at other passages of Scripture where Paul opens up a letter and he introduces himself, let's look at a few of them. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, where he's introducing himself in a letter to the church in Rome. He says, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. What's the word? Chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. I love Galatians 1.1 1, 1 because he doesn't use the word chosen, but he, he explains it in greater detail. Here's what he says in Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. This letter is from Paul, an apostle. He says, I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. What Paul is saying is, I was given the purpose that I'm living. I was given this purpose by God. This is his will for my life, and I'm going to choose to walk in it. God has a chosen purpose for your life. By the way, if you look at 1 Corinthians... 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, the first verses of 1 and 2 Timothy, the first verse of Titus. This is how Paul introduces himself. He says, I'm Paul, and God has a chosen plan for my life. I think our takeaway here needs to be this understanding that God has already selected a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. Let's think about it this way. I'm going to put this on the screen. It says, you are not responsible for choosing the purpose for your life. You are responsible for fulfilling your purpose. God already has decided what he wants you to do. He's already decided what the plan is for your life. It's good, it's pleasing, and it's perfect. Your responsibility is not to figure out, uh, uh, to decide for yourself what your purpose is, but to figure out what God's purpose is for your life and then to do it, and to live in it. This is what Scripture says about God's plans. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Listen, I don't want anyone in here to waste time doing good things that God didn't plan for you to do. There's a lot of good things that you can do in this world. You can leave here today and find a whole bunch of good things that you could go and do. But how much greater of a plan and a, 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 an idea would it be to go out and say, you know what, I want to do the good plan that God has for me in my life. What is the good purpose and plan that God has for you? Because takeaway number two is God has chosen a purpose for your life. Now let's look in at the, the when and the where. A little bit of Bible trivia on this church in Colossae. Who, who are these people? When was this letter written? And how does that context help us understand where we're going to go in this series? So if you back up a little bit, before this letter was written, Paul went on three missionary journeys. And when he was on his third missionary journey, you know, he's traveling these, these 10,000 miles proclaiming the gospel. When he's on the third one, he landed and, and spent a lot of time in a church called Ephesus. It's where we get the letter to the Ephesians, right? So he, he really loved the church in Ephesus. Scripture really kind of reveals that he spent most of his time, uh, as far as, not most of his time, but he spent more time with the church in Ephesus than he spent with any other church. He really loved the people. When he, when actually when he left Ephesus, it says that he, they got together and they just cried 
bitterly together because he loved these people so much. Well, it was when Paul was in Ephesus that he sent out two evangelists from Ephesus, a guy named Epaphras and another guy you've heard of named Timothy. He says, listen, I'm going to send you two out to this town called Colossae, and there I want you to share the gospel and plant a church. And so while Paul is in Ephesus, by the way, we actually believe, according to Scripture, that Paul's never actually been to Colossae. He sent out two evangelists, the, the power of delegation, of training up, making disciples, so that the spread of the gospel can go so much further. Because listen, God's not calling you to share the gospel with everyone. He's calling you to share the gospel with the people he's planned for you to share the gospel with and to train up disciples who can take the gospel to others. And so Paul has trained up Epaphras and Timothy. He sent them to this church in Colossae, and they started a church. He sent them to Colossae before there was a church, and they planted a church there. Now, some time later, around 61 to 63 AD, uh, Paul has now left Ephesus. He's now in prison in Rome and while he's there, he, he writes this letter to the church that now exists. So he's in prison when he writes this. That's important to know. We call it a prison epistle, right? He's not free because he's been sharing the gospel and he's being persecuted. They've arrested him and put him in jail. But he still has the ability to get some letters out. And he writes this letter to the church in Colossae. By the way, if you're wondering, like, where on a map do I find Colossae? The city doesn't exist anymore. There's another town that, that's there in its place, but it's in modern-day Turkey that you would find Colossae. All right? So if you find on a modern-day map Turkey, you kind of have an idea of the region that, that Col Colossians would have existed in. So let, let's talk about the Colossian people for just a moment. You know, uh, kind of a fun fact, the, the chief article of commerce that came out of Colossae, what what did the Colossians kind of create and sell throughout the world? And they, they were known for a, a, a renowned piece called the Colossinus. And the Colossinus was a very particular type of wool. And it was, it was usually purple in hue. And if you know anything about a purple color clothing back then, that was like very, very hard to find. It was only the wealthy Usually royalty would be dressed in purple just to kind of show off like, hey, I got a lot of money. Look at me, I'm dressed in purple. And so the colon uh, colonists, this particular wool uh, was what would have been sold out of the church in Colossae. Not the church, but the city of Colossae. And this, this is kind of this connection back to wealth and, and royalty. But what, what does Paul say about the church in Colossae, the people of the church in Colossae? Let's look at verse 2. This is what he says. He says, We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice he doesn't say, Hey, I'm writing to you all who are renowned for this really special wool. No, he says, Listen, I'm writing to you who he, he then goes on to call saints. Now, your version of Scripture might say the holy people Right? We are writing to God's holy people. If you've uh, got a different version than I have, it might say uh, to the saints in, in the city of Colossae. Here, here's the ultimate. We'll talk about that for just a moment. But here's the third takeaway I want you to write down is this. That God calls you up into holy living. God is calling each of us up into holy living. He's, he's asking us to take the next step into holy living. When you think of being called up, what kind of comes to mind in your mind? I'll tell you what immediately comes to my mind is Major League Baseball, right? When someone's being called up, that's a pretty exciting moment, right? If you go to, if you follow the Orioles on Facebook, right, that's when they're going to put, put a little video of a, a young kind of a guy who's in the, the minor leagues and you get to watch him make that phone call to dad and say, dad, guess what? I need you in Baltimore tonight. I got some tickets for you. I just got called up. I'm a major league baseball player today. Getting called up, that's an exciting thing. And what Paul simply does in the very first two verses of Colossians is he shows the people there that he's probably never even met in person. You guys are being called up 
You're being called to a particular style of living. There's, there's a title that he gives them in this, this word holy or saints. It comes from the Greek word um, hagios. And hagios is often translated into the word saints. But it technically means consecrated by God. What's beautiful about this is Paul calls all the men and women who are believers in the church. He calls every single one of them saints. Is that pretty powerful? I want you to think about what comes to your mind when I say the word saints. If someone were to call you a saint. I went to uh, artificial intelligence photo maker, an AI photo maker this week, and I typed in, uh, show me a group of saints. Like, make a picture of a group of saints. And this is the first picture that it created for me. And so, according to artificial intelligence, in order to be a saint, I don't know if you knew this, but you have to be a white Jesus, <laughs> apparently, right? I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I didn't realize you had to have a halo around your head and you had to constantly be praying in order to be a saint. Did you know that? You're not really a saint unless you're praying constantly. And you got you to gotta have a, a big cross necklace, apparently. I said, okay. So I went on to AI. I said, I don't like this picture. Give me a different picture. And this is what it gave me. Um, again, a bunch of old white guys carrying crosses around, okay? And this is what it looks like. And so I said, no, give me maybe a more modern day version of saints. And then it gave me this next picture. Uh, this is, so these are modern day saints. I got, I got some diversity, which was exciting. But still, you got to wear that big gold cross around your neck, people, or you're not nailing it, Right? And I said, I said, let me give it one more shot. I said, give me a picture of a group of saints. And then this is what I got. <laughs> so artificial intelligence didn't quite figure out what I was looking for. Because here's the beautiful thing. Paul is writing this letter to this church. And he's talking to the believers there at the church. And he calls them right off the bat. He calls them up into holy living by simply calling them saints pretty powerful you know i did i was curious um i looked within the catholic church if you're if you're catholic or grew up catholic or whatever i, I maybe i'll offend you for a minute i'm sorry but I, I i didn't know i'm like what does it take to be a saint within the catholic tradition and so i did some research and it's actually like a five-step process i learned a lot the first thing if you think someone should be a saint in the catholic tradition uh, they first, the first step is they have to have what's called a fame for holiness. In other words, they need to be well known in their country, in their region, maybe throughout the world as being a person that's, that's saintly. Like this person's pretty awesome and everybody knows it. So that's the first step. If you're not well known for being pretty cool and saintly, then you're not even going to be able to start this process. So once you get nominated as a person, like everybody knows Bob. Bob's awesome. Bob should be a saint. And then you, you, you petition Rome. And what happens is you, you tell Rome, hey, we think this guy should be a saint. And they start a process of research uh, where they, they go into Bob's background and they look at Bob's re, uh, references and they see all the things that Bob's done. And they determine whether or not there's actually a group called the Congregation for the Cause of Saints. That's the name of the team that does all this research. And with all this research, they determine whether or not you're going to move on to the next step of the process. If you get uh, a no, in other words, if the congregation for the cause of saints doesn't think that you're saintly enough, they're going to say no, and you can't appeal their decision. It's done. You're never going to be a saint, okay? But if they do find you as uh, saintly, then they're going to give you the title called venerable. And now your, your title just changed from Bob to venerable Bob, okay? And all that means now is that you're, you moved on to the next stage of the process. And now those who have been d labeled venerable, they're going to move into a process now where they research to see whether or not Bob has ever actually performed a miracle. Because in order to be a saint, you have to have a miracle ascribed to your name. So it's got to be something that can't be described by natural means. It's something that clearly was supernatural, that God used you to perform a miracle. And so they're going to research that. And if they find that you've performed a miracle, they're going to... Uh, give you a new title, which is a, a 
beatify you. They're going to beatify you where we get the, the beatitudes. They're, they're, you're now called blessed. So now we have venerable Bob has just become blessed Bob. Okay, and now blessed Bob, they're, they're going to do research again to see if Bob's done a second miracle. Bob has to have done a miracle since becoming beatified to this time right that we're talking about right now. Bob must have done a second miracle. And then if they determine, yet yeah, Bob did another miracle, then they send it up to Rome and the Holy Father Pope gets the ultimate say in whether or not Bob gets to be a saint or not. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that when Paul was writing to the church in Colossae, he's saying, listen, a quick letter to all of you who have gone through this five-step process and have been considered venerable and blessed and sanctified by the, the Holy Church in Rome, listen up, you, you three. You know, I don't know. Like, No, he's saying to everyone who's a brother or sister in Christ, you have been consecrated and set apart to live holy lives. Therefore, guess what? We are all called into sainthood. If you're a brother or sister in Christ, you've been called into sainthood. You are a saint. You've been called up to holy living. God's asking you to set yourself apart by God, consecrated to God for his purposes and his plan. We have all been called to be set apart. So now, the final question would be why. Why was this letter written? Now, I, I don't want to go into those details because over the next 11 weeks, you're going to hear why this letter was written. But I will give you the overview of why this letter was written, okay? Essentially, there was a heresy that was working its way through the, the church in Colossae. And Paul heard about it, and he was like, oh, 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 hold up. I need to write them a letter so they can stop this nonsense. And here... Here's what the heresy was. That the church in Colossae was, was hearing these ideas from the outside, from people who aren't following God's truth. And what they were saying is, you need Jesus, yes, plus something else. You need Jesus plus. You need Jesus plus, let's also worship some angels. Or you need Jesus, but you also need to follow the law. You need Jesus, plus you also need to uh, listen to the teachings of this person. Or you, it was always Jesus plus something else. And Paul's simply saying, hold up, listen, I want you guys to know that Jesus is all that you need. And so we're going to explore over the next 11 weeks how Jesus doesn't need anything. Uh, Jesus is supreme. The supremacy of Christ, you don't need to add anything to Jesus to make the gospel work. So now, what do we do with all this, all right? As we normally do, we end with a three-word prayer. I'm, I'm asking that right now, wherever you're sitting, you would ask the Holy Spirit what God wants you to do right now in this moment with this information. What is, what is the next step that you need to take just based on the first two verses of Colossians? We've talked about how God wants us to choose our new identity not to choose our identity, but to choose to walk in our identity. We also know that God has already decided the purpose for our life, and we get to decide whether or not we're going to embrace that purpose or run after our own. And that third takeaway is that God has called us up into holy living. And so with those three things in mind, I want to challenge you to think about a few things. One, I want to ask you to choose to walk in your new identity. Are you still making decisions that look like decisions you would have made before Christ? Are you still walking in your Saul when you should be choosing to walk in your Paul? How about this? I want to ask you to choose to embrace God's purpose for your life. There's a lot of really good purposes. There's a lot of good you could do out there, but I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what good purpose and plan do you have that's part of your will for my life that I should be running after. God, I want to do that, whatever it is. Because many of us in this room, we're, we're pursuing purposes and plans that aren't from God. We're pursuing our own heart's passions. We're running after things that make us excited. And we're not really asking God to, to lead us and direct us and show us his purpose for our lives. The third thing I want to ask you to consider is to choose to step up into holy living. What area of your life 
Are you not willing to give up? Is there an addiction, a sin issue, a a burden, a fear, something that you're just hanging on to? And God's saying, listen, I want to call you up into the majors. I want you to take the next step in your faith. I want you to to, to give up that thing so you can walk the holy life I have planned for you to, to walk. God has called you a saint. He wants you to be consecrated and set apart for him. What do you need to do to step up into that calling? What do you need to give up and turn over to him? Let's live the holy lives that God's called us to live. Now, here's how I'm gonna close today. The very last part of verse two, Paul gives me the words for the beginning of my closing prayer. And I wanna pray this over you. Here's what he says. He says, may God, our Father, give you grace and peace. Father, I I ask right now that you would give this church grace and peace. That as we explore the letter that, that you wrote through Paul to the church in Colossae, that we would see all the, the beautiful things that are available to us. How you, in your incredible grace for us, you have called us out of our old identity. You've given us a brand new purpose that is good and pleasing and perfect. You've given us everything we need to walk into it and to step up to the holy life that you've called us into. God, would you give us the grace that we need to embrace the next steps that we need to take? And would you then, God, give us the peace that comes with walking in alignment with your will. We know that when we do the things that you've called us to do, that peace is the result. That joy, that, that, that the burdens that we're carrying, we get to lay all that down because we know we're walking with you. Would you give us that grace? Would you give us that peace? Would you allow us as a church to really embrace all that you want to teach us through this series? We love you and we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC. Thank you.